Um, I'm Alex Conley, I'm at Imperial. I, I do the endocrine uh, bone clinic um, here at Imperial. So, um, again, the Cadigo guidelines um, that came out in 2017 is probably a, a fairly useful document. It's quite rigorous in its assessment of the evidence and quite critical in its assessment of the evidence and open, open about it. Um, and basically, as Sajan said, um, there's not much evidence for a lot of things. In the previous guidelines, there was all there was. There used to be a table where we used to stratify patients' um, CKD, and then they had a, a PTH target for each level of CKD. Um, and as some of you who may have um, worked with me, we used to look at that in back in 2016. But now um, it seems there's not really much evidence, and they give a wide scope for tolerating a PTH of between two to nine times the upper limit of normal. So essentially to, to about 60, um, something like that. Okay, so um, this is just a, a graph showing that as you progress through the stages of CKD, uh, what happens to the various uh, minerals and hormones uh, involved. Um, just useful uh, to see, um, okay. And here is the uh, um, a schematic of the pathogenesis. So essentially the kidney disease uh, causes an increase in phosphate um, and also a decreased activation of vitamin D. And all that contributes to your hyperparathyroidism. Just go back to that last slide, the one with the, the graphs. Yeah. So this is, as your renal function gets worse, your phosphate goes up and your FGF23 goes up. So what goes down is the activated vitamin D, as we know. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, so these these are a bit wordy, but I just put it all, all down because I thought it might be uh, by might be useful um, when you look back on it. So in chronic kidney disease, DEXA is useful, and as I said before, it's the hip that is the most uh, useful. It's actually the femoral neck that is the most. Uh, useful for pre predicting your fracture risk. And it's got a stronger association when your PTH is more uh, under control. So it's less, the association is less marked, for example, in Sajan's uh, patient. But, uh, uh, the main issue um, in CKD, MBD and osteoporosis is differentiating your high versus your low bone turnover states because you want to approach them slightly different. Um, the cutoffs are not robust for bone ALP and high uh, PTH. Um, I don't know if most of you, most of you hopefully can get access to uh, bone ALP assays. Um, sometimes labs will say, oh, but the total ALP is not raised, so why do I need to do the bone ALP? And then you'll have to explain exactly why in the clinical details. Um, so because, because PTH, calcium and phosphate and your PTH vary throughout your the week, essentially, depending on what you're eating, depending on when your dialysis session is, uh, depending if you fasted, depending if you're taking your medicines, at what point you're taking your medicines and things like that. In general, the best thing to do is look at the trends. So if we, if we think of uh, Sajan's patient, the trend of the PTH was going up uh, recently, which suggests um, a sort of high turnover and a sort of a predominance of secondary hyperparathyroidism. Bone biopsy used to be the gold standard, and I think basically that it's been sort of dropped from the, the recent guidelines as being that important, mainly because it's difficult to get um, get hold of. But it can be useful in very atypical cases, and you can identify mineralization defects and uh, uh, clarify exactly if the turnover is high or low um, by various stain uh, techniques. So PTH generally, if it's less than 10, suggests low turnover and a, a bone alk foss in the lower half of the normal range, so there's, not, there's no renal adjusted range, it's just the normal range, suggests low bone turnover. So these are the patients that you worry about giving them uh, anti-resorptive to, essentially. Okay, so for calcium, phosphate, and PTH, as I just said, so look at the trends rather than the individual results. Um, uh, treating one parameter will affect the other because they're all interlinked, as I showed in that previous diagram. Um, the overall um, feeling is that you should treat hyperphosphatemia because a higher phosphate leads to a higher cause, a higher uh, all-cause mortality. Um, 
Now, it's not it, it, that doesn't necessarily mean you should keep them to, uh, in the old guidelines, essentially they said you should aim for a normal phosphate. Here they sort of aim, say, treat a hyper, uh, a raised phosphate. The difference being that it hasn't been conclusively shown that reducing the phosphate or on the next section, re uh, increasing the calcium uh, reduces the mortality. So it's, it's more about just treating high values and trying to bring them them down rather than preservation of normal values. It does sound slightly like it doesn't make sense, but the, the basic concept is that bringing it down, you shouldn't focus too much on, on trying to normalize it, just try to bring it down as much as you can. Um, so dietary modification, so there's a lot of phosphate in everything uh, uh, we eat and uh, drink, a lot in s soft drinks, a lot of dietary supplements have phosphate in them, they're hidden source of phosphate. And then you've got your phosphate lowering therapies like Cervelomir um, and calcium acetate, which is a calcium containing um, uh, phosphate binder, generally not advised unless they are hypocalcemic. Um, so normally I think they use Cervelomir, I think Lanthium is the other one. But then you can make dialysis modifications to, uh, to help with the calcium phosphate bal uh, balance, depending on the fluids that are used there. Um, the hypocalcemia, again, treat on an individual basis. So, for example, for patients on sinicalcet and it's just under the normal, you don't sort of start putting them on calcium uh, supplements as well. Um, again, so low calcium, just as you've got high phosphate, is associated with a higher mortality. And in general, they don't want you giving excessive calcium there in chronic renal failure. Okay, so. As Sage and Lip alluded to, when your EGFR drops below 60, your pTH starts to go up, um, and the, the exact optimal pH, uh, pTH uh, is not known, but the higher it is, the higher the risk of morbidity and mortality, and elevations may be appropriate. So your phosphate, when you're in renal failure, will go up, so it's, it's uh, physiological and helpful for your pTH to go up to, to help you um, uh, remove the phosphate uh, from your body and also to try and drive as much activation of vitamin D as possible to keep your uh, calcium normal. So to a degree you should tolerate a raised phosphate. Um, so when the pH is up always look at modifiable uh, risk factors and um, things like hypocalcemia, vitamin D status, hyperphosphatemia um, and in general the sort of management involves giving normal vitamin D. So to stress again, even though I know it won't be activated in severe renal failure, there is evidence that you have extra renal activation. It's similar to patients with hypoparathyroidism who have no PTH and you may argue that we don't need to give them normal vitamin D, but most guidelines now um, agree that you should also give them normal vitamin D. By normal, I mean 25 hydroxy vitamin D because of this the evidence of extra renal uh, hydroxylation and the benefits of it. So, uh, give them cholecalciferol, uh, that should be 25, yeah, that's right, okay, 1000 units a day, something like that, um, and can help in mild renal failure control the PTH uh, with minimal risk of hypercalcemia. And so, the risk with the activated ones, your alpha calcitols, calcitriols, etc., um, is the risk of hypercalcemia. Um, and in, uh, there is some evidence that it does help maintain your bone mineral density and is really should be reserved for very severe um, renal uh, impairment. The Sinacalcet, the evidence is not conclusive. So the Evolve trial, um, the primary outcome, it didn't, it didn't reach, but in the, if you look in the um, subgroup analysis, basically if you're elderly, so over 65, there probably is a, uh, an improvement in risk of uh, reduction of fracture risk by 12% and also an overall uh, decreased morbidity and uh, mortality. So um, generally when you're thinking about um, osteoporosis and CKD, um, first you want to think about managing or excluding any metabolic, uh, no, sorry, any mineral bone disorder. So MBD is not metabolic bone disorder, it's mineral bone disorder. Um, and so that's your calcium, your phosphate, your PTH, your vitamin Ds. Okay, so once you've got on top of that, then you start thinking about going down the osteoporosis route because some of your 
uh, low bone mineral density may just be a manifestation of your uh, mineral bone disorder, which you can correct using what we've just been talking about. Um, if there's no history of fracture, uh, you may just consider monitoring uh, the patient. Um, as I alluded to earlier, it's only a portion of your bone strength is your uh, is your DEXA scan. So in all patient, in, in some patients, you may just want to monitor them. Um, and then you've got your high bone turnover on the left versus your low bone turnover on the right. So the high bone turnover, as we said, has the high PTH, classically above nine times the upper limit of normal, so greater than 60. Um, you normally got a raised uh, uh, bone out across, or at least towards the upper end of the normal range. Um, and in some cases, you may do a bone uh, biopsy. And then on the right hand side, your low bone turnover with your PTH, which is under 10. So it can be raised, but for renal failure, under 10 would be suggestive of uh, low bone turnover in this situation. You've got a low bone outcross, and again, you may have a bone biopsy. So in terms of the treatments for your, your in your high bone turnover, it's fine. You can use anti-resorptives, and I'll come on to which ones you may want to use uh, in a coming slide. And then for your low bone turnover, Classically, there was a lot of fear about uh, using anti-resorptives because of your risk of adynamic bone. Um, but there's, there is some evidence that it may be okay to a degree, obviously not when it's adynamic bone, but when you've got sort of medium uh, uh, bone turnover. Partly because some of the anti-resorptives may not be taken up so well, actually, by the bone, because when you've got low bone turnover, the... the uh, the bisphosphonates, for example, uh, they get taken up by active bone, so less will be taken up. Um, and you can also consider using teriparatide, uh, which will boost up um, intermittently your uh, your PTH levels, and it, that it's that intermittent nature that has an anabolic effect versus versus a chronically raised PTH, which has a more um, uh, catabolic effect. So um, these are just so just look at the the green things. These are the basic the studies looking at various um, uh, treatments in various stages of renal failure. Now I'm not saying you can use these. These are not uh, not necessarily safe. For example, uh, um, or, or they're they're not licensed uh, uh, things. But in general, alendronate BNF is eGFR 35. A resedronate and uh, is down to 30. Uh, zoledronate is 35 as well. Um, so the toxicity of zoledronate is that basically in renal failure, if you give it as a single dose over 15 minutes, which is the traditional way, it can precipitate acute renal failure in some of the early literature. So some people will give it very slowly, maybe over an hour, um, and with a bag of fluids and hope for the best and, and in general it's been okay and some people will reduce the dose maybe down to four milligrams um, as well I've seen that that done um, with the oral bisphosphonates you can sometimes I've seen people halve it um, so you give 35 milligrams which is the normal dose of resedronate 35 milligrams a week you give it every two weeks um, but you just need to monitor their renal function for any deterioration uh, regularly but uh, in terms of BNF it's EGFR of 30 Aroxifene looks like it could be safe for down to dialysis um, in some circumstances and can work as well. Uh, teriparatide has been used successfully down to an EGFR of 30 um, with 15% increases in bone mineral density and a massive 72% fracture risk reduction. Um, and then uh, denosumab, uh, generally, uh, at least in, in in our department, we go down to an EGFR of 15, um, but you've got a massive risk of hypocalcemia, which can be up to 40% of patients will have a, nadir a low nadir calcium about seven to 10 days after the denosumab. So for them, they should all uh, traditionally be on calcium vitamin D supplementation. I normally tell them to have an extra Greek yogurt a day um, uh, for two weeks after their injection, um, so I like to promote Greek yogurts, and uh, then I normally uh, tell them to be aware of any tingling and, and just uh, take an extra ad cal or a creepy three if they've got tingling. 
and um, ultimately they have a blood test normally the day seven to ten after each injection. It can be quite profound this hypocalcemia and once it starts it's you're going to end up bringing this patient uh, up to the wards uh, almost on a weekly basis to monitor it so it can take a long time uh, to uh, reverse. Um, others, so some give Zillagio over 60 minutes and you can give alternate day or your oral bisphosphonates. So here's just a, a chart of the of the EGFRs that uh, are uh, sort of permitted and what, what are used um, for each drug, alendronate, zelendronate, resedronate, roloxifene, denosumab, teraparotide, and then you, the half dose, the, the sort of experimental use of half dose um, oral bisosinates um, and zelendronate over a more prolonged time, and also the, the case reports of the use of teraparotide and denosumab in dialysis patients. Um, so that is that.